So after last week's closed Dynamite, I was dying to see what they were going to do to follow up with this week's show. And you know what? I'll say this. I like what I've seen out of Dynamite the past two weeks in terms of the fact that it gives me some things that I can bitch about, which is, frankly, therapeutic for me in some ways, and certainly appeals to some of you, many of you that click on my videos and consistently watch them. And that's why many of you subscribe. And if you don't subscribe, you should. You absolutely should. And then follow the show on Twitter. So you get, you get some of that. But then they get a couple of segments that I really enjoy that are really, really good. And it's enough to balance it out. So is it perfect? No. Is it great? Usually not. But I get enough. Like, at least I get things to latch on to, things to hold on to. And I will, at this point in stage, certainly take that. Um, you know, now, certainly the opening match I could have entirely done without Penta El Cerro versus Cody Rhodes. I mean, at least you could say this had a little bit of a story, so this wasn't completely out of the blue and random. That's good. Uh, but it had a little bit of story. Like, there, there should be layers to this. Like, the level of effort put forth in the match and the things done in the match and the story that you tell in the match should actually tell the match the story that has actually been told in the story. And in this case, of course, instead, they just do what idiots do in this company and they just go balls to the walls with a bunch of near falls and a bunch of spot monkey bullshit. And after all of that, all the big time moves, you got Penta kicking out of Crossroads and everything else. Of course, Cody wins with a goddamn roll up just so that way you can have Penta attack him after the match. Cody's got to get his win in on TV, it seems like here. And then you still have him do the attack anyways. Well, why can't we do that afterwards? And the whole thing about QT Marshall, who gives a shit at this point, frankly? Um, you know, I would have rather have not seen this match have a decisive finish because I think the story would have been more intriguing. Leave the people wanting more. You know, now Cody's already beaten him with a roll-up. You know, that's just stupid. That's some shit that WWE would do. Stop that. But at least we quickly dispatched with this Cody bullshit and we moved on to what really matters. Oh, Jade. Sweet, sweet Jade Cargill. She's fantastic. She needs to be one of the building blocks, one of the pillars of this AEW women's division. Just like who she was jabbered on with during this match. Not her opponent, Danny Jordan, but Red Velvet. Like, those cakes should also be featured prominently in AEW in the future. I just want to say to Jade and Red Velvet, there's no need to fight. There's no need to argue. There's enough of me to go around. So why don't you just go ahead and make up and give each other a kiss? I will make it through this entire review. I will make it through this entire review. I will make it through this entire review. God, I'm going to make it through this entire review. Uh, but, you know, it was short, sweet, and to the point, and it continues the story. Jade looked great. Fantastic for me. And I guess we got our answer pretty quickly. And I like how AEW structured this show at the beginning this week. Like, they were diving right in. No playing it out. No dragging it out. You know, you're not sitting there and forcing fans to wait to the end. Like, this is what people want to see. Like, come at it and come at it aggressively. And they did. I thought they pieced this well to get together very well for this tape show. Uh, we found out. That MJF and his new group with Sean Spears and FTR and Wardlow, Batista 2.0 and uh, fucking Tully Blanchard is going to be the pinnacle. That's their name. Do you like that better than the inner circle? Let me know in the comments below. And they're taking their place atop AEW's food chain. Now, what I will say is this. This promo work by MJF was fantastic. I love the fact that Inner Circle wasn't there to interrupt or interject or anything. Like, there's no reason for that. No reason to rush the story. You got a couple of months until your next pay-per-view. You just did this big hot thing that had people buzzing last week to close out your show. Follow up with this. Absolutely follow up with this. And, and it works. And like I said, MJF's promo work was fantastic. You know, some of the best promo work I think he's done in months. Um, and now you're off to the races for the next several months with the pinnacle and inner circle in their story. The only shameful thing about it is that MJF's not the AEW world champion. Because can you imagine looking at Kenny Omega and then looking at MJF and looking at the potential that you have for the story between the pinnacle group and inner circle and saying, yeah, we want the belt on Kenny Omega instead. Like, who the fuck thinks that? Really? Seriously? I'm just saying. Um, but 
I certainly got everything that I wanted out of that promo segment. It was really, really well done. Of course, we immediately follow that up with another big schmaz of a faction and a tag team match. It's kind of like, eh. You know, it's a good reminder of AEW has too many people on the roster, therefore they have too many damn tag matches. Uh, but Team Hardy, I'll call them, versus the Jurassic Express and Bear Country. I, I, why do they continue to try and force Jungle Boy so much? Why? Then you got that idiot Marco Stunt damn near killed himself this week. I won't wish that upon him for sure, but damn, like, slow the fuck down and be careful. Um, but yeah, Team Hardy wins. I don't really care. It pisses me off that they continue to not feature the Luchasaurus more prominently. Like, this is a guy that they should be featuring. And you're going to point to, well, look at the match that he had this week on the YouTube show and the, the botches there. And you watch all these other matches and how much other botchy bullshit you've got. Like, if anything, that's AEW's fucking fault for putting out tape shit and having it look like that. That's stupid. You have the chance to edit that and cut that out and you still let it go? That's your own damn fault. That doesn't change the fact that this is a guy that they should be featuring. Not pushing to the side for the sake of fucking Jungle Boy. God. Unbelievable. Christian answered the question that everybody wants to know. Like, what is he doing back? What's he going to do? He's coming for you, Kenny Omega! He's coming for you! Even though we've had him say it and... He's not really doing much with Kenny Omega because you're still focusing on Omega and the Moxley Kingston stuff, which is it's okay, sure, whatever, uh, which you got the John Moxley-Eddie Kingston tag match taking on the Good Brothers. You know, this is, this is whatever it is. Like, you're trying to follow up on what happened at Revolution. I get all of that. Moxley and Kingston as a tag team, I think, will work for the time being. But again, you know, like you're aligning these friends, these longtime running buddies, how many damn tag teams do we need in AEW? That's kind of my whole issue. And even if you say, well, if it's not a tag team, then it's a faction. Again, I ask, how many damn factions do you need? When is enough enough? When is too much too much? Uh, and then, of course, we get the weekly Tony Schiavone. Tony Schiavone. It's Sting! Like, how many times are we going to play the same old song and dance here? So he comes out with Darby Allen and... You know, Lance Archer comes out to interrupt them as they're talking on the mic, and apparently Darby is an indie riffic joke, which I frankly kind of agree with. Not my cup of tea. But you can't say I'm a total Darby Allen hater either. If you watch some of my videos in the past, I have said some good things. Not everything has to speak to me. Not everything has to resonate with me for me to understand and get that there's an appeal for folks there. Uh, to me, there was no appeal with Jake's, Jake the Snake Roberts calling him a weenie. Like, have we, have we digressed that far? Like, leave those childish, stupid, petty-ass remarks to somebody like me. Like, that's well within my wheelhouse, Jay. Like, you're a legend. You're an all-time great. You have to, have to, have to have better ammunition in the tank and the chamber and the holster than that shit. Are you kidding me? I appreciate Darby Allen calling out that he hasn't been much as a TNT champion and he wants to start defending the title every week. Cool. You know what? Hey, feature your mid-card champion. For a company that's clearly basing themselves a lot around the in-ring product, it ties in, it makes sense. I even like the Scorpio Sky video package that they did after this. Like, you're giving a guy a chance to get a character and find a niche because, you know, Scorpio Sky, you look at him and you say, he should be something, but he's not. And he needs something. He needs something, some type of straw to stir the drink, and hopefully where they're going with this will ultimately help him get there. You had Angelico versus Ray Phoenix in a match who gives a shit about was literally just there to fill time. So why the hell would I care about any about it? And and frankly, when it gets to it, like I'm looking at the big things that happened on the show, like, you know, the two biggest things that maybe tune in this week, you know, three, because you always got to throw in Jay Card, Jay, ugh, it's late. I apologize. My girl Jade, you know, I'll be Bugs and you be Lola. I'll give you a good spanking. Shit, I don't care, Jade. You give me a fucking spank. You fuck me up. But I knew Jade Cargill was wrestling this week. I knew we were going to hear from MJF and his new faction and wanted to hear that. Both of those delivered. And then it was this unsanctioned, lights out, anything goes match between Thunder Rosa and Britt Baker. Your first ever women's match main event in AEW in their almost year and a half history. 
And while it took too long, by God, this one was worth it. This one brought the goods. Like if you're going to go with a lights out, anything goes on sanctioned match, then you really need to go balls to the walls. Whether you always think the thumbtack spots work or whether you think it looks great to have both of these ladies bleeding like stuck pigs like they were, you know, the bottom line is, is this match worked. And at least there was some level of story here to merit and justify this type of match. Now, think about if you had consistently featured this story for a couple of months consistently and made it a big deal and really fully maximized the story potential leading up to this match, how much more special this match would have been. Of course, you didn't because we're talking about AEW, but this was outstanding. Like this, this was outstanding. Was it a little bit overdone? Yes. Is it, did they go too far in some cases? Perhaps. But you know, when you're talking about the ladies in the spot that they're in, like I could judge it from that lens and say that Thunder Rosa and Dr. Britt Baker knew going into this match that they had to deliver the goods. Like this is a big spot for them. And they knew that, you know, they're blazing a trail and they're setting a tone and they're wanting to prove that the ladies can do it too, AEW. And when you look at this, you'd say, well, shit, yeah, absolutely they can. They're both decent characters. They have something interesting about them. These are two of the ladies that should be the future building blocks for your fucking women's division, along with the likes of Jade Cargill, along with the likes of Red Velvet, like Thunder Rosa, Britt Baker. They should be two of the other ones, and there's absolutely no way you can sit there and say they shouldn't be based off of what you saw in this match. And in fact, the biggest single criticism I have about this is I can't imagine being somebody involved in AEW looking at this match featuring two ladies that neither one of them is the champion and neither one of them are wrestling for a shot at the championship. Looking at these two ladies and then saying, I want Hikaru Shida to continue to be my freaking AEW women's champion. What in the hell is wrong with you? Like you could have put your women's championship in this spot, had it prominently featured as the main event of your show. And instead you have your champion who once again is nowhere to be fucking found. And for you whiny crybabies, they're going to say, well, you sit there and talk shit about Hikaru Shida. Oh, uh, because her as champion is fucking stupid. And I'm really criticizing here Kenny Omega and the leadership within AEW. Like, get over this Joshi wrestler fetish. If they're not bringing shit to the table and you don't know what the hell to do with them, then stop putting him on television. More importantly, stop putting your damn women's championship on him so you don't do shit with the champions. In the past couple of weeks, we have some, some kick-ass matches in AEW involving ladies. Jade and Red Velvet, that Shaq tag match. That's one. Thunder Rosa, Britt Baker, that's two. Bam! Four of the ladies you build your damn division around. One of them should be champion now. One of them should be top contender. Period. That's it. It's not that hard. So this should have meant so much more if the story was more consistently developed on television week in and week out, like consistently made an emphasis, made a focus. It would have taken this match to another level. If this match had the championship, it would have taken it to another level still. It's some of the failings of AEW and Kenny Omega and the leadership within that company that this match was really, really damn good when it could have been completely epic. But still a really, really, really great way to finish out this show. I had some highlights. The three things that I tuned in for this week to want to see uh, all delivered for me. The rest of it could mostly, frankly, kick rocks. Stop having Luchasaurus fucking blues! That's all I got to say about Dynamite this week. You tell me in the comments what you thought of this week's show. I'll see you later.